Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Jennifer Joyce, Regional Vice President for Sales for the West here at Conducive. And here with me today, I have got my partner in crime, Howard Butler, Senior Director of Systems Engineering. Howard is a 30 plus year veteran of Conducive, and he is a complete expert in the inner workings of the Windows operating system, which we're gonna be talking about today. Howard, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks Jennifer, really glad to be here. And uh, hey everyone, don't let uh, Jennifer's title fool you. Uh, she's been with the company for over a decade and uh, is quite technical as well. So, uh, you know, please pay attention to what she might have to say, not just listen to the man behind the curtain here. Um, <laughs> one quick housekeeping item though is, this is gonna be a rather interactive webcast. So please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A box. There's, there's a questions box there and we'll get to them as we go along or we may even defer and hold those towards the end there but uh, in either case though we will get through all the questions as quickly as possible so thanks very much jennifer great thank you howard uh so we're going to jump into our agenda here real quick and and one other quick housekeeping item on the agenda is we're going to divide today's webinar into two parts. The first section I would refer to as the executive briefing portion of the webinar where we're going to cover the use cases and the benefits. Uh, that'll be the first 20 minutes or so of the webinar and um, if you need to get to something else after that you could drop off but the second part you probably really want to stick around for because that is going to be the technical briefing uh, that's where we're actually going to get into the technical deep dive and uh, stick with us through the end because we'll get down into the weeds on exactly how we do this so what we're going to talk about today is some of the challenges of implementing VDI effectively and you know performance equation and things like that. And then we're gonna dive into these use cases that you can see here. We really wanted to focus on real world third-party testing as well in live production environments. So we're gonna highlight some of those. Uh, real quick, just a, a little bit on who Conducive is. Keep this real high level, uh, but always good to know who you're talking with. We are a 39-year-old software company. And uh, I, I wanna just call attention to a couple of our scout badges here. It's what I like to call our scout badges. Uh, specifically, we are a Microsoft Gold Partner and we have been since day one, since the program was launched. Uh, we are just one of a handful of companies actually that have ever had access to the Microsoft operating system source code. Uh, and in fact, Howard, who's on the call with us today, is one of our team members who is able to work directly with that source code, uh, getting some really deep insights into the inner workings of the Windows operating system. So I think you're really gonna enjoy hearing from him a little bit later during the technical briefing, um, where he's gonna take that technical deep dive with you on how Velocity interfaces with Windows to literally transform IO to become more efficient. Uh, we are also Citrix Ready certified, and we are a VMware TAP partner. So we've kind of got the, the big three there covered on uh, desktop virtualization. So I want to talk just a few minutes here about kind of what's happening in the VDI scene. You know, we're all familiar with the S curve of product adoption. Uh, you know, when something hits that 90% market saturation, it's considered to be at maturity. We don't know how long it's gonna take for any given product to get there or even if it will. Uh, but let's roll through a couple of examples. Um, you know, I, I didn't put the horse and buggy on here, but uh, got a Model T Ford. So I'd say that that's gone past its uh, prime all the way into obsolescence. There's some museums that have some pieces around, uh, you know, the, the VHS and the floppy disk. So those are some really good examples. Now at a full maturity point, we could probably consider hard disk drives uh, where they're probably starting on a little bit of a decline, although there's quite a few of them are still out there. Uh, but we're really into a maturity phase with our tiered storage, uh, clients, all flash storage and virtualization. And uh, virtualization, you know, is it didn't take that long for that one to ramp up into that 90% plus adoption rate. We're now 99%. Um, now, the growth curve is kind of an interesting thing because we're really in the growth curve on these three emerging technologies. Uh, we've got cloud, VDI, and hyperconverged infrastructure are the ones that have the most growth momentum right now, and they're you know climbing that climbing that uh, hill. It's kind of interesting because you know a lot of our customers are still just talking about cloud. There's a lot of golf course conversations going on uh, about that right now, and people are starting to dip their toes in, but VDI is a little bit more advanced, and given our current climate, 
uh, VDI adoption has taken a hyper acceleration in that growth curve. So we were really, uh, you know, January of this year, uh, not quite there, and it's gotten a lot of interest, and uh, we're really accelerating that. So we're, you know, constantly getting comments on VDI for getting it adopted that it's a little bit complex to do. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits and barriers of VDI adoption. And, you know, one of the things about benefits that's really clear is that getting mobility and productivity, streamlining management of a single platform, um, you know, and uh, also just managing a central image and just having low maintenance endpoints and low cost endpoints. Those are all clear benefits. But we're also constantly met with comments on it being complex, it's expensive. Uh, we regularly hear that when the analysis is done, it's still more cost effective to maintain the physical desktop. But that's not really gonna be practical now that people are working remote. Uh, the other thing that we hear a lot is that it's difficult to deploy and manage, and also that it requires quite a bit of in-house expertise. A lot of times as well, end user perception is that their desktops were faster and they're not really wanting to make the transition e either. So there's a lot of pressure from both sides. And then we also have the fact that TCO is still quite often more expensive on you know, supporting the virtualized infrastructure for VDI than it would have been to have uh, just stuck with traditional desktops. So the, the problem though is that despite the barriers, we are now at this point where we have to get it up and running. We, we absolutely have to make it work. And it's kind of interesting because one of the TCO points of this is real estate. Um, just saw an article, I think it was Barclays, it was just saying we're probably going to move away from the traditional tower downtown and uh, they're probably going to have many, many more remote workers in the future. So once you're able to start getting rid of some of this real estate costs, now the TCO ROI balance really comes in for VDI adoption. So just some things for us to think about. Um, now, one of the things that we recently stumbled across, it was really funny, one of our customers, they, they have us deployed throughout their data center on all of their servers, and they have a large VDI implementation, and they were looking at having to cut density on their VDI in half as they upgraded to Windows 10. Uh, they also, um, you know, had had some issues with performance hits, I guess, even two years ago when the Spectrum meltdown patches came out, they had to decrease VDI density then as well. Uh, what happened was they went to the publisher of their, their core tier one application in their VDI environment and they asked for suggestions on how they could improve the metrics. Uh, so the first thing that they were told was add more hardware. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid adding more hardware and still getting better performance. And the second recommendation they got was assess everything in the image. I'm not sure how helpful assess everything in the images because really when you assess the image, all you're going to do is either try to choose applications to strip out, which you have already decided you need, or you can recode, which isn't really going to happen. We all know that. Uh, but as he said that to me, I, I kind of just popped out and said, you know, the Windows OS is in the image. And he started laughing. He's like, you know, you're right. Because he was aware of what our software does for their servers. Velocity is improving throughput on Windows environments, whether they're server or VDI, by 30 to 40 percent. And we do that by directly optimizing the Windows OS. Um, and so you actually can do something about the image. Uh, and in effect, that, that's what we can do with Velocity. So as a Microsoft Gold Partner, our Citrix Ready Certification and our VMware TAP Alliance Partnership, uh, we are ready and poised to help everybody in these virtual desktop and remote user access environments. Now let's just dive right into our first use case. Um, so this one is, uh, really this chart is just some of the test results that we had from um, our Citrix Ready certification. We used Iometer benchmarks. They were run on Windows 10 system running Citrix Zen desktop VDA, uh, both with and without our Velocity product present. Now, when Velocity was present on the same workloads, transaction rates increased by over 90%. And also on the same benchmarks in the same amount of time, the workload that we were able to process in the same amount of time increased by 60%. So throughput accelerated, able to process more transactions. Uh, so that was really, really impressive stuff that we got. Um, now, one of the things I want to cover before we go into our second use case, and that's that the next use case is also going to be uh, with VROPS testing on live production workloads. But there's a couple of things, concepts that I like to call the the two I/O myths or the two I/O fallacies. 
Uh, the first one is the IOPS fallacy. So let's talk about this real quick. Um, the myth is that we have more than enough IOPS to handle the workload. And the reality is a little bit different than that. I'm gonna just give you a quick example. So, you know, I'm I'm five foot three. I own that. I, I'm I'm wear flats, I walk into the room and I'm every inch of that five foot three. So when I walk into the room and it's extremely crowded, uh, and my mission, should I choose to accept it, is to walk from one side of the room to the other without touching or bumping into anybody else. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Uh, but I'm not going to be able to accomplish that mission because there's so many people in the room. Now, there happen to be 20-foot ceilings in this room. So I look up, and there's 15 feet of airspace above me. I'm not able to leverage that. I still have to use the five to six feet of space that everyone's milling around in. So that's a lot like our IOPS. We may have 100,000 IOPS uh, sitting on, rating on our, our backend storage, but how much of that are we actually using? Maybe 3%. Um, what we want to focus on is not kind of the red herring of our headroom, but we want to look at the 3 to 10% that's actually being used and accelerate the throughput of that by 30 to 40% at a minimum. So that's what we're really looking at with the velocity equation, is that workloads are literally processing 30 to 40% slower than they need to be. The reason is what I was alluding to earlier about the Windows OS. It's the way Windows is handling data and the way it presents I.O. to storage. Windows presents I.O. in a small, split, random I.O. pattern. And... And what we want to focus on, too, is that we also have the fact that sequential I.O. always outperforms random I.O., okay? And so we're getting this random I.O. pattern. Now, the truth of the matter is that only a small percentage of the total I.O. capacity is used at any one time. We just kind of went over that. Um, we can basically get a false sense of performance security uh, ideas due to the high IOPS ratings and all of that overhead that's not going to be used and never will be used. Uh, and a lot of times that IOPS ratings is is being provided just because of the amount of storage capacity that someone got. It's not because they're ever going to actually be able to use or tap into that. Um, now, velocity optimizes the work being done and not the spare capacity that isn't being used. So again, that's the main focus here. So that's the IOPS fallacy. Now, there is another fallacy that I want to touch on, and that is what we refer to as the IO response time fallacy. Now, mm -hmm. we can get really misled by IO response time. You know, we look at the sub millisecond response times on individual IOs, and that gives us another false sense of security that things are going as fast as they possibly can. But that's not actually the case. So the myth is that faster IO response time is better, okay? The reality is that one individual smaller IO transfers faster than a larger IO. You have less data, it goes faster, bigger, more payload, it takes longer. The other thing this does not take into account is that split I.O. versus contiguous I.O. transfers at different speeds, and random I.O. versus sequential I.O. also has different data transfer rates. So we really want to take all three of these things into consideration, the size of the I.O., if it's split or contiguous, or if it's random or sequential. So the truth of the matter is that the focus and over, over prioritization of looking at individual IO response time has really kind of misled us in calculating throughput and overall performance. And overall throughput is always going to be slower with the, what I like to call the unhealthy IO profile of split small random IO. It's always going to be faster with the opposite of the contiguous larger sequential IO. Now I'm going to go ahead and hop into um, the second use case here. And Howard, um, maybe I could actually ask you to speak to this. I'd really appreciate that. Sure, Jennifer, thanks very much. So guys, let's take a quick look at what IO transformation with velocity can do. We're gonna go through these slides kind of quickly, so kind of buckle up, pay attention here because you know I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about each individual slide. Uh, but the nice thing here is that we can validate this with third-party tools. Tools that you probably already have in your environment, like VROPS or vSphere, and other type of tools, um, which is what we've used here at, at this particular hospital environment. The orange lines represent what the measurements were with velocity. And as you can see, there's a pretty nice trend of improvement on write requests per second. Now, if we go on to the next slide here, 
and we take a look at write latency. Oops, sorry about We get that. to the point where we're thinking of, you know, if you were only thinking of one particular metric, you'd be looking at write latency and going, huh, seems like things might be slowing down a little bit here. Um, but this kind of ties back to what Jennifer was saying um, in terms of the IO myth and the response time. So let's now see what happens with the next slide. And we look at this and we go, huh? The write rate just went through the roof once what velocity was enabled. So Jennifer, if you kind of go back to the previous slide just for a second. Sure. So again, if we're looking at write latency, sometimes the latency is going up and being maybe quite a bit longer in time. But if we look at the rate, the transfer rate, if we go back to the, to the next advanced slide there, we can kind of see that um, things have dramatically improved. We're doing two to six times more workflow in the environment. So this is kind of ties back into what Jennifer was saying about you can't just look at one single number and say it's good or bad. Okay. And and we have been conditioned into thinking that either IOs per second or individual average IO response time latency is the holy grail. And that's not really true unless you look at what was the data transfer rates occurring at the same time? So Jennifer, if we advance to the next slide, and let's talk a little bit about, I believe we're gonna talk about uh, read latency. And here we can see the latency also went up um, and took a little bit longer in some cases. We're still in a very solid stance in terms of you know, fractions of milliseconds, okay? But if we go on to the next slide and look at the read rates, we're just killing it. Who wouldn't want to get this kind of throughput for just a slight increase in individual IO latency? It really is a function of how much more work can you push through the system than some magical mythical number about, I got 100,000 IOPS or I got, you know, sub millisecond uh, response time. You're not getting the work done. And if we can make, help you get more work done, then you're taking more advantage and getting more efficient use out of your existing environment there. So when we're looking at this, um, and, and Jennifer, yes, the, this slide here, the usage, we can think, I think this picture pretty much speaks for itself. Um, you know, and it's really, let me just kind of mention something here too. It's not really about individual user experience. Okay, now of course, it ultimately may break or boil down to that, but you have to kind of think about from a VDI perspective, why do you currently have the VDI density set the way you do? Okay, and it really is because of user experience. So you've kind of already optimized that user experience. Otherwise, you would have 10, 20, 30 times more VDI um, systems in the mix than you currently do today. And the reason you don't is because of that kills the, the user experience. So when you put velocity in your environment, it's really not a valid question to go back and ask the users if they've noticed anything faster. They're already conditioned for it to be fast. You've already managed that end user experience by scaling down your VDI density. But what I'm saying is that with Velocity install, installed, I believe that you can scale it back up and still keep the end user experience at its optimum uh, expectation. And Jennifer, if we go on to the next slide, and I just wanna kind of touch upon this um, briefly here. Um, but the one point I wanted to make here is just how important this concept of IO transformation really is. And sure, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper dive in a, in a few slides later on uh, when we get to the technical portion of, of today's event. But 
if we just look at this, this graphic, okay, from a high level to sum it up, this is what we want to have happen from a right IO perspective. We want to be able to take all these split, small, random IOs and transform them into these contiguous, larger, sequential IOs. Because an IO is an IO is an IO. It takes a certain amount of time for that data to uh, um, be manipulated and so forth. But if you are doing fewer IOs to do the work, that is going to be the key of getting 30 to 40% more throughput. And your hardware should be able to perform faster than it currently is. But the way in which Windows is handling the data logically, it's kind of like Windows has its foot on the brake pedal of your Maserati. Think of velocity as kind of pressing down on that accelerator to make things go faster. So now let's take a look at our third use case. And again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this one. This one is from a Horizon View environment. And this particular customer is running a pure all-flash type storage. And again, we tested with uh, collecting data from VROPs. And these numbers are from a Fortune 500 company. And in fact, it's one of those household name cable companies. Uh, and these were the samplings from one of their massive call centers. And we can kind of see that the data usage rate is significantly better, more than double in most cases here. And if we go on to the next slide, we'll talk about commands per second. Again, significantly improved, more than double in most cases. And here we go again with the average number of write requests we can see that across the board, every system is realizing a significant increase in its workflow or activity. And taking a look here at the write rate, you know, measurement of kilobytes per second, shows that the average number of kilobytes written to the disk each second, as we can see across the board, every system is seeing a very significant increase in activity and this would tie back to velocity transforming those small split random ios into being larger contiguous sequential type data streams and as we move on here we can see the same thing happening with the read rate again it's significantly increasing the activity or workflow how much more work can the users get done I think we got one more here that we can we can talk about. This is a, another case study at a at a state agency. And I got two more cases here we'll we'll briefly be talking about. But just wrapping this one up, one of our partners did this POC and brought the results back to us um, from the customer. And the conclusion was that the net result is that velocity would enable them to run double the number of VDI clients in their environment, and possibly five times more with just a little bit more DRAM memory. So it's much better than having to over-purchase and buy more hosts, um, more hardware, more iron to the mix, which is a really costly proposition. So let's take a look at their numbers real quickly. And as I said, they have near number of identical systems, but notice, that there was a decrease in CPU usage, yet there was an increase or a greater amount of activity. Now we do expect the memory usage to go up, um, but that's memory usage that would have otherwise been classified as free, idle, or unused memory. So we're helping to take advantage of a wasted resource and putting it to good use. Let's dynamically use a portion of that memory to help get things moving faster. This results in far less network traffic, allowing that user to do more transactions as we've talked about using the same amount of hardware. And then if we move on to this fifth and final use case, this is where we tested on a load balance Citrix 
type of terminal server environment. This customer handpicked 10 systems to install Velocity on, and then they chose another different 10 systems as a control group. And the customer tested using vSphere and they sent us the data back. And the conclusion was that they would have a 32% improvement in reads and 18% improvement on writes. So I think that's very substantial, very significant. So I think that kind of wraps up, puts a nice bow on the, on the uh, use cases. And I hope that this information has been kind of helpful to everyone. So Jennifer, I'm gonna kind of toss it back over to you for a, for a moment here. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Howard. And just a quick note for everyone, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to evaluate velocity, but the nice thing about evaluating in a VDI environment is you literally just throw velocity into the gold image and you're up and running. So it's it's that easy. So a couple of things that um, we do get asked are kind of what are what are the common benefits that people get from Velocity. We've obviously touched on a bunch of those in review of the use cases, but we're really looking for that better application performance, uh, fa faster data transfer rates, uh, reduced timeouts and crashes, especially in SQL environments, shorter backups, um, those types of things. And just getting, you know, sweating the hardware and just getting more life out of the asset. Um, you know, it, it really does make a big difference. So um, we've got a lot of our customers who also, um, you know, have come in with comments about VDI and what it has done for them uh, on different hardware and different environments. It's, it's quite, uh, quite astounding. So talking a little bit about how we do the uh, evaluation, uh, really the proof of concept, it is at no charge. It is free. You will have a full 30 days to try the software. And uh, if needed, uh, we can provide an extension to the trial. We have done that on occasion when it's required. Maybe someone needs to test in multiple phases and do a test environment first and then go to production. Um, we also have a pre-POC consultation to ensure that the evaluation is set up correctly, validate the benchmark counters that you'll be using to conduct the POC. Uh, and we typically complete our VDI POCs in under two weeks and then review the results with you uh, and help write and craft a business case for you to get the okay on acquiring the software. Um, so that is a quick summary of what I just said. So we're just going to keep moving on. So we're going to go ahead and head into the technical briefing portion of this real quick. And um, one question that I have, uh, if people could drop into the comments or the question section in the chat box is, uh, do you currently have VDI implemented? If so, just type in yes and type in the platform you're on, if it's a, if it's a Citrix or a Horizon, uh, and maybe how many concurrent sessions you're running. So that would be great if you guys could drop that information into the chat box real quick. Um, or if you're just in the planning stages. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and drop into the technical portion of this and how we make this happen. So we have um, a really high level rudimentary you know example here of a virtual environment and you know as great as virtualization is for efficiency uh, one of the biggest downsides is that it does add complexity to the data, data path we've had people come in and say look this application runs fine on our fat clients but as soon as we virtualized we lost performance you know that that's what ends up happening when virtualization gets into the mix and adds in that complexity so there are two severe inefficiencies that are causing this. The first one we refer to is the Windows IO tax, and the second one is the IO blunder effect. Now, the Windows IO tax is what I was referring to earlier as the fact that Windows creates small split and random IO. And when you have this happening from all of the data sources, it really starts to add up. I'm just going to give you one quick example now on the IO blunder effect. So, in this next slide, you can see if you deploy velocity to just one system, uh, you're going to optimize that one system and it will certainly help, but you're still going to have all of the IO pressure from the neighboring VMs or clients hurting the performance of the first one. And I think we recall call this uh, also not the IO blunder effect, but we also call it just IO contention. One really great uh, classic example of this recently was a customer who actually in a SQL server environment, uh, six hosts, 120 SQL servers supporting 120 different customers and one of them was having severe performance issues we deployed just to that one system didn't get the results we then deployed to all of the systems and we got the result uh, they went from missing their sla every month for over a year to making their sla by 17 minutes but when we went to just one system 
they didn't make the SLA. When we went to their 10 heaviest systems, they made the SLA by three minutes, not very comfortable. And when we took the software off, they missed the SLA again. And then when we put the software all in, on all 120, that's when they made the SLA by 17 minutes. That IO blender effect is very, very powerful and definitely not to be uh, underestimated. So we're gonna go ahead and um, take a look here at a little bit more about velocity and where it sits. So Velocity is a 100% software solution. And the orange bar that you see there is basically where we install, right inside the Windows OS. Uh, it basically is comprised of two light filter drivers. It's fenced by Windows and it only talks to Windows, which means it's compatible with everything. It sits above everything else in your environment, above the hypervisor, the server, the networks and storage. Uh, and what that means is that we're hitting the data optimization at the source rather than the symptom. It also means that we're compatible with everything. Because we're fenced by Windows, uh, we only talk to Windows. Everything else is compatible with Windows. We are good to go. So really important points there is that uh, we're right inside the Windows OS. We're compatible with everything. And we are getting source versus symptoms. And this is where what Howard was talking about earlier of transforming the IO from that small fractured random IO to larger, fewer sequential IO. And that is what's resulting in that fast, faster data transfer rates. And again, if you're only using three to 10% of your IOPS in your storage in the first place, let's use it as fast as we can and get the throughput and data transfer rates of the portion you're using accelerated. So there are a couple things that our software does. The first is write optimization. Now, I'll describe this engine on the next slide and how it eliminates 30% of all write I.O. Uh, this is the engine that converts that small fractured random I.O. to larger, fewer sequential I.O. And then the second engine that I'm going to be covering is um, our DRAM read caching engine, what we really refer to as establishing a tier zero caching strategy uh, by using the idle available DRAM that you already have to serve hot reads. We'll get deeper into that as well. And then I will show you some screenshots on the reporting. Now we are on the home stretch. We've just got a couple of slides left. Left Since we are at the bottom of the hour, if anyone has to drop, just a reminder that the session is being recorded. You will receive a recording of the session. We will send it to everybody who's on, but hopefully you can stick with us for the last couple minutes here. So we're just gonna get under the hood here real quick of how this does uh, the optimization work. So with IntelliWrite, um, and again, we're gonna keep this high level. We can certainly go into a lot deeper dive uh, on one-on-one -on -one calls with folks. But in effect, what you have is the fact that the Windows operating system is organizing files in uh, logically in a really inefficient manner. And one of the reasons it does that is because Windows is missing the file size intelligence. So Howard, like an example would be if you had a 64K file that Windows was gonna try to write logically, can you explain how that might degrade into that small split randomized IO profile instead of being large and sequential natively? Well, sure. So Windows lacks the intelligence of knowing where are the larger segments of free space. Uh, in fact, it simply just grabs the first available chunk of, of free space from where it last wrote or left left off and so the result is your application may send an io request to write let's say uh, 64 kb worth of data but if the next available free space is only 4 kb windows will write what it can complete that io or send it on down the wire and then grab the next available free space and continue on uh, in that process until it wrote all 64 um, KB worth of data. So the end result is instead of having one single IO, Windows has now inflated that and caused perhaps uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of extra tiny, small type of IO requests. And each one of those takes extra time to be processed by the guest system, the host hypervisor, perhaps out across the network, increasing your traffic there, as well as at the storage level. Thanks, Howard. So that's our IntelliWrite engine. And, and what this really results in is that typically, you know, an average, a gig of data might take about 100,000 IOs to write on average. So when we're installed, 
it literally means that that same 100,000 IOs, that same gig of data can now be done in just 70,000 IOs. We literally remove 30% of the IO by transforming it into that larger contiguous IO. So it really does have a force multiplier effect when you start thinking about all of the work being done concurrently in your environment by your users. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind too is that if it writes clean, it reads clean. So if you have 30% fewer writes, natively you're gonna have 30% fewer reads. Now, as great as this engine is, we can layer on top of that and get additional benefits in the read space. Now, this is our engine called IntelliMemory. And um, just wanna just note real quick, since we're starting to talk about caching and memory use, is that the engine we just finished talking about, our write engine, does not use any memory. There's no buffering of writes going on. All of that is passed through. So the only place that we're storing anything in memory is on reads. Uh, that question always comes up, so I thought I'd just answer that real quick proactively. So it's completely safe on your writes. Power outage, don't worry about it. So so let's talk again about this engine though. This is our DRAM read caching engine, as I uh, alluded to, and we like to call this our tier zero cache strategy. Um, the nice thing about this engine, and probably the real genius of it, is the fact that there's no resource contention. It is completely dynamic. Uh, no memory is permanently reserved or allocated. What we do use, we're borrowing uh, and just kind of dipping our toes into the pool. Lifeguard blows the whistle, everybody out of the pool, we get out of the water and give that memory back instantly. Um, how we kind of maintain that integrity where we don't get into any memory contention is that we have what I like to call a starting line. There's a minimum amount of memory that has to be free at all times, which like I said, gets instant really, instantly released and Velocity is gonna be checking every second to make sure that that free space is there. Um, and it'll back off entirely if we need to. But the, here's the really cool thing about it, um, is it doesn't require a lot of memory to be effective. In fact, what you natively have in your environment is probably already enough. Um, a lot of folks we're talking with these days are sitting at you know eight gigs minimum on their VDI image. Um, and I'd be kind of curious if any of the attendees uh, would drop in comments of how what they have as far as memory on their image for VDI if they are running VDI. Um, but yeah, we've not had to have anybody re-architect or increase. In fact, a couple of the use cases we put up, uh, people had just four gigs of free memory in those VDI clients and it was highly effective. And Howard, real quick, um, just curious if you might just talk a little bit more, because this is the thing that we get the most questions about, is that, that dynamic memory allocation and just how we release that memory. Yeah, well, sure, Jennifer. So this is an animated visual of just how Velocity dynamically adjusts its memory usage to only using free, available, unused memory that would be idle anyway. It's also intelligent enough to know when there's a demand for that memory, and then it will begin to release memory from its cache, giving it back to Windows. So there's never a shortage of free memory uh, keeping Windows, this keeps Windows and other applications quite happy. We're just leveraging a, a resource that's underutilized and uh, can make uh, make hay with it. Cool, great. Thank you very much, Howard. So the last, I think, two slides here, um, <clears throat> second to last or third, uh, we're getting real close here. I pulled out um, from VMware's best practices guide, uh, something that they were talking about around improving IO performance. And this is right from their vSphere 6.5 guide. Um, now, what they what they talk about on the first one here is basically increasing virtual machine memory. And that makes total sense. Uh, what they're trying to say is basically, they were saying, hey, maybe the OS can offload and, and do some recaching. Uh, through the OS's engine. We all know that's not happening. You already have plenty of free memory. The OS is not using it, but the concept holds true. Let's use DRAM to cache hot repetitive reads right from the VM, save all of that traffic from having to go down to storage. And also memory to memory data transfers are gonna be 12 to 15 times faster than going down to even flash storage. So let's leverage that space there is what the recommendation is saying. Velocity takes that with its IntelliMemory engine and does that on an enterprise class level. The second one is defragment the file systems on all guests. Well, that also is basically translated into get all of your files into large sequential arrangement. Now, uh, you, there's a better way to get there. You don't have to defragment it if it's not fragmented in the first place, which is what Velocity does. So we are in effect able to get Windows to not fragment anything in the first place. A good analogy for this is kind of the egg on the wall. Egg on the wall falls, breaks. It's a lot of work. Everyone's got to come in, clean it up, put it back together. We just don't let the egg fall and break. So you're keeping that large sequential data pattern 
from the start, nothing to clean up. So that's really uh, kind of interesting that their uh, recommendations for the enhanced disk IO performance are exactly in alignment with our enterprise class solution. This is what our UI looks like. Um, we have this at a uh, individual install level. We also have this at the dashboard level of our velocity management console. So you'll be able to see all of your IO reduction, your storage IO time saved, and you'll also in the console level be able to get a listing of all of your systems uh, even into the thousands and we can do aggregate reports or we can break them out system by system so you can see what benefits you're getting on each system. So that's the uh, kind of the wrap up of our call today and um, if there are any questions go ahead and drop them into the box right now um, but we have really enjoyed uh, presenting this to you today we're looking forward to helping you out with an evaluation evaluation steps like I said we can schedule a 15 to 20 minute uh, pre POC consultation call assess if your environment is a good candidate and if so we'll customize a proof of concept plan for you and uh, velocity is able to be installed right into your image or deployed through the velocity management console there is no reboot required to install or uninstall the software and we're also happy to provide you with um, budgetary quotes and pricing and uh, help you with the executive summary and business case when you're ready to present it. So Howard, I want to thank you very much for uh, your expertise and sharing your knowledge with us today. And I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So thank you very much, Howard, and thanks everyone for attending. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.